Perfect. All right. So by the way, ladies, you should just know if you ever miss a class, we record all the classes. So you can always listen to it. I think my husband posts the link down the weekly Friday email. So it's always nice to learn about the Parsha um, for that week. So this is, um, you know, we're, we're in the third book of Vayikra, right? How many, how many books of the Torah are there? There's five books. You know, somebody was asking me last week about um, we're doing the Torah as a book club. I mean, come on. That's like, but the truth is, it's the best book out there. I haven't found a better one. It has the most interesting stories, the most questionable stuff uh, and, and, and events that take place. And it's the book of our history. So you're not going to find a better one. Um, but, you know, all jokes aside, we know that the Torah is not meant to be a history book. It's meant from the word hora'a to teach. It's a lesson, it's a blueprint of how to live our lives. If you Jew wants to know how to live their lives, they open up the Torah and it's all there. To tell us how we wake up in the morning, how we go to sleep, how we act, how morals, ethics, everything from, from top to bottom, the way we eat, the way we speak, the blueprint of how to live our lives. So each parsha, each Torah portion, a lot of it is stories, but more importantly, there are lessons for us on this is the story of our lives. The Alter Rebbe, the author of the Tanya, was fond of saying that we need to live with the times. What does that mean? Not living with the latest fashion that you could do too. But living with the times means what is the Parsha of the week? There's a message for us that week. And most people who come to this class will tell me that was just what I needed to hear that week. Because the, less, the, 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 the Parsha of the week is, is teaching us something about some experience that we're going through right now in our lives. So we have a custom at our book club is we sing a little song at the beginning of our, the best way to learn is through song. So we actually um, learn the five books of the Torah and the names of the Parshiot through a song. And we sing it every single week before we begin class. And I can tell you that I, I feel like I used to sing alone, but now I have company. I feel like you're, you're getting better at it, ladies. So if you open up to the table of contents, You'll see over there, and I'm just repeating this because there's a couple of new people here today. Um, you see how the five books of the Torah, the Torah scroll that you see in a synagogue, the Torah scroll, this is the book that's written for that Torah scroll. In other words, the Torah scroll that's written on a, on a parchment has been put into this book, and it's divided into five parts. If you look in the beginning, it says Genesis, which in Hebrew is Beratius, Exodus is Shemos, Leviticus is Vayikra, Bamidbar is Numbers, and Devarim is Deuteronomy. And every single week from the beginning of the year, the Jewish New Year, which is the end of Simchas Torah, October time, we begin and we read one portion every week. And we take, uh, by, yes. the end of the, by the end of the year, we mm -hmm. complete all 52 parshas. I'll do it right after, right after the class. I'm just going to mute somebody. And then you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, so we are pretty much, would you say we're halfway in the middle of the year? Roughly so. So we're actually, we're, this week's Parsha's, Parsha's, Parsha's Emmer. And Parsha's Emmer is, all, we're at the end of the third book. So we're pretty much halfway, a little bit more than halfway through the year. So let's go, ladies. Let's do our song. We start from the beginning. Genesis, Beratius, Noah, Number two, Shimo Vaira, Bo Bo Bo, Vishala, Kiso Vatim, Shimo Vaira, Bo Bo Bo, Vishala, Kiso Vatim, Book number three. Vayikrata Shemini Tazriyam Tzara Vayikrata Shemini 
Kazriya Mithra Ahremos Kedoshim. Our week is Emar. Emar Behar Bechukosai. Oh, I'm out of breath there. I never sang so long. We are, so you see what I'm saying? We're up to Parshas Emar. That is where we're holding. And hopefully by the end of the year, you'll know all 52 Parshas by heart. And songs really help. I, I um, when I taught fifth grade in um, Hebrew day school, I, a yeshiva day school, I um, sang this with them every single morning before they, we started learning from the Chumash. And by the end of the year, they, you know, these 10 year olds, uh, they knew all, they knew it by heart. So it's just constant practice, like with anything in life. Okay. No, this no, is just a, a song that somebody made up that I adapted. Yeah, yeah. Anything that you learned as in song, especially when you're a child, stays with you forever. It's actually amazing. I'm sure you remember that in your own lives, right? Like things that you learned as a child. So Parsha means chapter. Good question. Um, so Parsha's MR uh, begins on page number 780. Let's open up to 780. And so I, I was explaining last week. So open up to page 780. You're with me, Zoom ladies? Okay. So I was explaining last week how um, Vayikra, Parshas Vayikra, Leviticus, this book, this third book out of the five books, in a way is, you know, for sure growing up as a kid, was the, for sure the most boring one of all, because there's not that many stories, because Beratius begins with the creation of the world, Adam, Noah, Avraham, Abraham and Sarah, Yitzhak and Yaakov, and then in Shemos, it, uh, it goes on to Jacob and the 12 tribes and Joseph and the story and the, 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 the slavery and the leaving of Egypt, and they cross over the sea and they get into the desert and they receive the Torah and then finally they travel for 40, 40 years they make 42 stops along the way until they get to the land of Israel and during this 42 excuse me this 40 year, that's when they actually learn Torah that's when they actually understand all the mitzvahs that they're given yes and the Chumash Vayikra this entire chap this entire book is a lot a lot a lot of dry material meaning it's a lot of commandments, a lot of mitzvahs. You'll find most sources for most of the 613 commandments are in the book of Ayikra. Most, not all, but most. Um, and it's actually very interesting because we always say that um, the Torah is not a history book. If Chumash uh, Beratius, Chumash means that first book of Beratius, Genesis actually covers, um, I believe like the first, like 2,000 years of history. Chumash Shemos covers, I'm like making up these numbers, but I'm just thinking roughly, like from when the Jews, Shemos starts off when Jacob comes down to Egypt, right, with all his tribes, and it ends, it's like a couple hundred years. So the first one's a couple thousand, the second book's a couple hundred, and this book, by Yikra, is within the 40-year period of the Jews traveling. And then Bamidbar Devarim is even like shorter. It's like a couple of weeks because that's when Moshe repeats the whole Torah at the end. So just to give you an, an, an idea, if this was a history book, it would be a lot more organized, right? It would be a lot more, in, it would be a lot more structured, right? Each book covers a certain amount of years, but th that is not the case because each book teaches us something else. Yes. And it's very hard to, yeah, that's a great question. I, um, let me get my pen. Oh, well, um, let me just write this down. Graph of the years. Yeah, no, but I, I, what I, if I write it down, there's a possibility I'll remember next week to send a link because I've seen that. That's a great question. I'm also very visual like that. Um, which reminds me, I'm going to ask Sasha to bring me out. Can you come? 
Um, because I have something I want to show you visual. Okay, so in 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 Emmer, right? Right now, the Torah is speaking about different laws, and the parsha of Emmer. By the way, does anyone know what the word Emmer means? Nobody. It's such a basic Hebrew word. Say again. Uh, to call Amarti. Or Amarti means to. To speak, very good. Because you'll hear it like literally every other sentence. Vayomer Moshe, Vayomer Hashem, Vayomer. Vayomer comes from the word emar, to speak. It's the, the root word is emar. Emar means to speak. And it begins with certain laws. By the way, you could study the meaning of the name of the Parsha for two hours, unrelated to, it's like unbelievable. But it talks about a lot of laws pertaining to Kohanim. Now, just for reference, does everyone here know what a Kohan is? Kohen. Yes. Okay, it's close. Okay, so just for reference, a Kohen loosely translated as a priest. Jewish priests, Kohanim, come. How do you know if you are a Kohen? It's a tribal lineage comes from your father. There you go. Why? How does he know he was, he's a Kohen? Because his father was a Kohen. It's like the joke of the guy who comes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, please, I want to be a coin. I want to be a coin. The rabbi says, I'm so sorry. I can't. It doesn't work that way. Begs him every day, comes, finally offers him money. He says, sir, I, 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 it doesn't work. I can't make you a coin. So he says, tell me, sir, why do you so badly want to be a coin? He says, my father was a coin. <laughs> so in, in, in Judaism, tribal lineage comes from whichever we all descend from one of the 12 tribes, just comes from your father. When you get married, you adapt your husband's um, lineage. Like my mother and my mother-in-law, both are daughters of Kohanim. My grandfather, Mardukai, was a Kohen, and my mother-in-law's father, Nahum, was a Kohen. Both have sons, but both have those names. And they, but they married my father-in-law. My father are both not, they're not Kohanim. So me, as the next descendant, I'm a Yisrael, an Israelite. How is it divided? There's three types of Jews, a Kohen, a Levite, and a Yisrael. You've heard of those? Yeah. Or in English, a priest, a Levite, or an Israelite. From the 12 tribes, who were descendant? How do you know who were the, how do you know if you were a Kohen? Who was the very first Kohen? Aaron. Very, very good, Aaron. Moshe's brother, Aaron. Thank you, Sasha. Aaron's uh, Moshe's brother, Aaron. He got a reward from Hashem that he would be the very first Kohen. He was the priest in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, as they were traveling in the desert. And all of their descendants of Aaron were Kohanim, and all the descendants of Moshe, his brother, were Levites. Levites have a privilege. They're second in line the coin is the highest level the levite they served in the temple by uh, playing musical instruments when um a male is called up to the torah first person that's get called up to the torah if there's a coin in the crowd he will be first if there's a levite he will be second etc it's a certain honorable privilege and moshe and aaron i'm doing a little geography uh family tree here moshe and aaron who is their mother Yocheved. Two days, you have to unmute yourself. Who, who is it? Yocheved. Yocheved was Moshe and Aaron's mother. It's unbelievable. You ask most Jews, who, who was, um, who was um, Jesus' mother? Everybody knows. Yeah. <laughs> Jews, come on, Moses' mother. <laughs> um, just saying. Um, she, she watched it. Miriam was, the, yes. Yeah. So Yocheved, I just thought I'd mention it. Yosef, was, not Yosef, um, Moshe and Aaron's mother was Yocheved. Who was Yocheved's father? This is a tough one. I'll, I'll give you a hint. It was one of the 12 tribes. She's a granddaughter of Jacob. So one of Jacob's sons was her father. Which of those 12, you know, Jacob had 12 children. Yehuda. I know. Who? Nope. This is so important. 
So we have over here Yaakov. Oh, this boy. No, it's actually oh, that's actually the one. Who's the, um, who are, I'll, I'll, how about this? I'll sing you the 12 tribes and you call it out if you think that's the one. Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar, Zevulan, Dun, Naphtali, God, Asher, Yosef, Binyamin. These are the 12. Who is it? Binyamin. Very good. It was Levi. Reuven, Shimon, Levi. Levi was the third of the 12 tribes. His daughter, he had three, four children. Just for fun, I'll throw the names in. Gershon, Kahas, Merari, and Yocheved. Three sons and a daughter. Yocheved had Moshe, Aaron, and then Miriam. So Levi is, if you come from the tribe of Levi, there's a possibility that you're a Cohen or a Levi. Get it? This Parsha talks about laws pertaining to Kohanim. That's what I just wanted to explain. Well, so, <laughs> that's right, exactly. <laughs> and there's a lot of very interesting laws pertaining to Kohanim. Some apply today, some won't apply till the coming of Mashiach when the temple will be rebuilt again. And there's a lot of, um, it also talks about different um, sacrifices that are, are brought for different um, occasions. It talks about some of the holidays. It talks about some of the vessels in the um, in the tabernacle in the temple. It's a very interesting parsha, not necessarily related to each other, but some random combinations of different laws that are applicable. One of the laws that we are going to talk about today begins in on page number chapter twenty three which is on page number 795, verse number nine. Are you with me? I'm in the middle of the page where it says the Omer offering. Yep, you're with me? We're going to read it together. You might be a little confused. You might be like, by the way, ladies on Zoom, do you hear me? I know there's a guy mowing the grass. It's okay? You hear me okay? Yeah, okay. So we are going to um, read the verse, and then you can ask me all your questions. Okay? God spoke to Moses saying, speak to your children of Israel and say to them, you're with me? When you come to the land which I am giving you, and you reap its harvest, which land? Israel, you should bring an Omer measure from the first of your reaping to the priest. He should wave the Omer backwards, forwards, upwards, downwards before God so that it will be accepted by God on your behalf. The priest should wave it on the day following the first rest day of Pesach. On the day that you wave the Omer, you should offer up the following as its accompaniment a perfect unblemished lamb in its first year as a burnt offering to God. Its associated meal offering should be two tenths of an ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil as a fire offering, which causes a pleasant aroma to God. Its associated wine libation should be a quarter of a hint of wine. You should not eat bread, parched grain, or parched kernels from the new crop until this very day until you bring the Omer offering for your God. This is an eternal statue throughout your generations in all the places that you live. This is the first commandment of what I'm about to read. Turn the page 797. Second commandment pertaining to the Omer. From the day following the first rest day of Pesach, the day you bring the Omer as a wave offering, you should count for yourself seven weeks. When you count them, they should be perfect. You should count up until, but not including 50 days, i.e. the day following the seventh week. And on the 50th day, you should bring the first meal offering from the new crop to God. And then it goes on to say, describe the, the sacrifice. So we have over here two commandments. Commandment number one is to bring the Omer offering, which we have no idea what that is. 
And the second one is that after you bring this offering, count seven weeks, and on the 50th day, which falls out to be Shavuot, the day that we receive the Torah, you should bring a different type of offering. Very good. What's the Omer? So question number one to all of you is, have you ever heard the word Omer before? In what context? Okay, very good. So you heard it in the context of counting the Omer. It comes from here. Counting the Omer. What else have you heard it in what context? Have you heard any other Hebrew words associated with it? What is it? No, okay. Lagba Omer. Very good. Lagba Omer. This is where it comes from. Okay. So what was the Omer offering? The word Omer is a measurement. Believe it or not, it's actually a measurement within the Torah. The Omer was a certain measurement of barley that was brought up as a sacrifice, an offering, a karban in Hebrew, on the second day of Pesach. And the bringing of this Omer permitted, right after that, all types of grains to be eaten. That's what the offering was. See, up until now, they weren't able, they only eat matzah, right? Mm -hmm. When they brought up the offering, Pesach was over. They were able to bring up from now on, they were able to start to eat their wheat. How much is an omer? Anybody know? Okay, how, that, so it tells us that in the parentheses. But what does it say in Hebrew? Just for fun. It's a little- Hi, Rivka. Yes. Quick question. Yes. The owner uh, that's supposed to be brought up is for Hashem, yes? Correct. Who eats it? So it's a very good question. A lot of times there were certain parts of the, the sacrifices that were brought up and burnt, and certain parts were given to the Kohen to eat. Particularly the Omer, I don't know the answer to that. Let's see if we can find it. I will look it up and let you know, because every sacrifice had different parts that were eaten and certain parts that were burnt. I don't know which particular parts, because if you see in verse 12, it tells us three things that were included in the Omer offering. There was an unblemished lamb, there was a meal offering of the barley, and there was a part of wine. So it's not clear which one was eaten and which one was not, but I'm sure it's written somewhere and I will look it up for you. It's an interesting question. Thank you for asking that. So we're going back to how much is an Omer? The Omer, it says, is one-tenth of an Afa. What's an Afa? An Afa is three Se'as. What's a Se'a? Se'a. A Se'a equals to six calves. What's a Kav? A Kav equals four logs. What's a log? Each log equals six eggs. So basically, it roughly, if you, if you, it's roughly the, the space between 43.2 eggs. In English, 2.6 quarts. Um, it's very interesting the way it's written. It's not so simple. How and why was the Omer offering waived? So we read clearly that it describes how the coin had to wave it. The priest had to take this omer of barley and he moved it to the north and then it went to the south, to the east, to the west and back. He raised it, he lowered it. Um, there was a, a whole process and it's actually its own discussion of why this was necessary. It speaks about how this, when you, the horizontal movement neutralized certain destructive winds and the vertical movement neutralize certain destructive dues and do d e w and that's its own conversation on its own which i'm going to put to the side for just one moment because i want to get to the meat of what i'm trying to um to, to teach now why is it called the omer offering what is the deeper significance and meaning of this the word omer just means a measure right which is a very strange that it's like the amount of green that they brought it's strange that an offering should be called by a measurement, right? It's like saying, this is the court offering. This is the leader offering, right? 
all other offerings have a name. For example, the Pesach offering, the offering of the Toda, which is of, of Thanksgiving, the Shlomim, which was for Shalom, for peace, uh, the Shtehalech and the two loaves, right? They have descriptive names. Omer is a measure. Why should that be the name of an offering? So what's so crucial about this particular offering was that we tie the entire counting from Pesach up until Shavuot, so seven weeks between these two holidays, between Passover and Shavuot, it's so closely connected that we say every day, today is the first day of the Omer, today is the exactly. second day of the Omer. That's what counting the Omer is. We're counting from when the first Omer was brought. Mm -hmm. Lag ba Omer, lag is Lamed Gimel. Lamed is 30, Gimel is three. Lag ba Omer is called Lag ba Omer simply because it's the 33rd day since we brought the Omer. We celebrate it because of what happened on that day. Which is Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Chai passed away, uh, passed away, and Rabbi Akiva's students stopped dying. Unrelated to the name of the day, we just call that day Lag Omer because it's the thirty third day of the Omer. But you understand, we we relate to life for these seven weeks through the Omer. That's the way a Jew thinks during this time. So it's not really because when you when 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 you learn it in that form and you actually count the Omer every single night, you start to think that way. Ah, very good. Get it? That's, that's the million dollar question. Why was the Omer, let's backtrack a bit. A, a, a bit. Why was the Omer brought on the 16th day of Nisan, right? The, the, the Pesach is on 15th day of Nisan. And it says that the Omer was brought the next day on the 16th day of Nisan. It's not like this is anything special happened. Not like the Jews left Egypt on that day. It's the second day of Pesach. And it's like, it's not like they crossed the sea. That was later. What, what happened on the 16th day of Pesach that's so monumental that they brought the Omer on that day? So one of the Midrashim explain is that the, uh, the key to understanding the Omer is by understanding that in the desert, Hashem provided every single day food for the Jewish people. What was that food called? Manna. The manna. How much manna did a Jew receive? Yes. An omer. An omer's worth of grain, of manna was provided. So it, it, it says that in the wilderness, I provided a daily omer of manna for every Jew as payment. Let the Jew now bring for me an omer offering on the every year on the 16th of Nisan. So the Medrash tells us that the purpose of the omer, this omer offering, is to remind us of the omer that we received in the desert. That's why it's called by the name of Omer, to remind us of this famous Omer of manna that the Jewish people received. And we mentioned this many times, that the manna that we received in the desert is a reminder, right? When the Jewish people were in the desert, did they doubt God for even a minute? They definitely questioned him. Did they doubt him? Did they doubt him? They fetched. That's when the question began. But did they doubt his existence? There's they no way they could have. Know. I'll tell you why they couldn't have. Because their daily sustenance came from heaven. It's like when a Jew, when a, when a person, when what is it? Yeah, thank you. You know, when, when we work today, right? We work for our money. So after a while, if you're doing well, you can say, you know, I'm pretty successful because of my own doing. I worked hard and I'm able to provide. There's a confusion that can come about that a person could attain their own personal success to themselves. In the desert, there was no such luck. You're hungry, look up, <laughs> the food's coming. It's like, I always say, one of the most precious things about a, a, a baby is that they're so dependent on you, right? There's something so beautiful about that dependency. They, they, there's like that love, that, that knowledge that their food is gonna come from you. In the desert, the Jewish people had that same, even though they complained and they argued and they, you know, there was lots of stories yeah. and life lessons. But at the end of the day, everybody knew that God provided food. So um, the, 
the the pur the purpose of the bringing of the omer is that when we harvest a new crop we might come to think that maybe this is the power of my own hand so by bringing the omer right when the crops are ready pause omer priest who works for hashem reminder where your food comes from it was like a stop remind yourself who's in charge which is by the way an unbelievable lesson in our own lives that is actually the reason of why when women make challah we take a portion of that bread and we make that blessing what's the mitzvah of challah we take a, a piece of, of dough and we say we say a blessing we say this is a bread that was are separating for Hashem and we wrap it and we burn it before we make our bread, simply for this reason, to remind ourselves, dough, or literally our dough is like our dough, our, you know, <laughs> our, our sustenance, food, it represents everything physical. So everything in our lives come from Hashem. So when we take that separation, we, we sort of stop, think, remember, and it puts everything into perspective. It's a different bread, it's a different experience. And specifically a woman, this is just side point, who has that, who nourishes her family, right? A woman that are nurturers of the home. No better person to give that reminder to her family than her because she's able to take the physical sustenance in, in, her, in her family and elevate it to holiness like nobody else. Yes. Yes. So it has to be like minimum Omar. Correct. Yes, that's a very good thing. Yes, very good. In order to be able to take Lahafrishala, to be able to take her blessing, you have to make minimum an omer of dough. Another point I want to mention here is that this also explains why the omer was brought on the 16th of Nisa. Remember, I said, what's the connection? What was the second day of Pesach? Like, why then? Because there's tradition tells us that the manna stopped falling on the seventh of Adar, when Moshe passed away. They had left over in vessels until the 16th of Nisan. So when they ran out of the manna, that's when they brought the Umar offering. Hoping that they would get more. No, it started a new era. Then they entered into the land of Israel and life changed forever. <laughs> and they had to start working for a living. Um, Okay, so now this describes the, the sacrifice element. Now let's talk about the second commandment, the counting, like you correctly associated in the beginning. I said, who knows anything about uh, uh, Omer? And most people said, we know that you count the Omer. So when do we count? The Omer begins the second night of Passover until the night before Shavuot. Every night, right? The second night of Passover is the night in Judaism starts the day, the night before, the day starts the night before. So like on Shabbat, we start Friday night. So the second night of Pesach is right before the second day of Pesach. And we say tonight is day one. The next night we say tonight is day two. Tonight is day three. We count every single night. In fact, in the evening service, there's a part that says, if you're in the spirit time, this is the portion that you say. Um, and you could count it any time throughout the night. If you miss it, you can still count, but you can't count with the blessing. I remember when I had Nahama, my daughter, my oldest daughter, she was she's born on the 27th of year. And I I was nervous that when I would go into the into labor, I would totally forget to count. I'm always thinking about counting the Omer, but I wanted so badly like finish it. That was like one of the only years I actually counted every night with the blessing. Ask me this year if I'm, I'm in with the blessing. Unfortunately not. Because you have to remember every single night. You can still count, but you can't count with the blessing. It's a beautiful, it's a, it's a beautiful mitzvah. Um, once you're out, you're out. Uh, with, uh, from saying it with the blessing. It's always like a contest in my family. Who's going to be in till the end? So I got a couple of kids still in. Unfortunately, I'm out. But um, this counting is... No, he's out. <laughs> he tried. Um, okay, why do we count? What are we counting for? Say that again. 
So we received the Torah on the 50th day. So that's exactly it. Anytime you have something, especially as a child, right? When you're excited, you know, you have a family wedding and you cross off every day in the calendar, five days left, four days left, three days left, right? Anytime you have an anticipation of something, of a, something exciting, when you count, you show your excitement. So like Mia correctly said, um, the receiving of the Torah, which was on the 50th day on Shavuot, this excitement of, of receiving the Torah, this is the reason why we count. In fact, when we say the blessing over the Torah, um, Baruch Atah, right? Uh, we say, we, we say, no saying HaTorah, right? Hashem is, what no saying HaTorah, what does that mean? That Hashem is giving the Torah, not gave the Torah, because the Torah, just like we're learning right now, this is relevant today. It's not something in the past. So when we are now counting and getting ready for the receiving of the Torah, which is in a couple of weeks, right? We're now on the 30th day of the Omer. There's a vlog for Omer. The 33rd is on Friday. 32nd is on Thursday. The 31st is on Wednesday. We're on the 30th day of the Omer. So we're two thirds done, right? Because we're going to the 50th. So every single day we count the Omer for the receiving of the Torah, because we are receiving the Torah again on the holiday of Shavuot. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Now, um, also another thing is the purpose of leaving Egypt. Why did the Jewish people leave Egypt? They left Egypt so they can get the Torah. They didn't. Well, first of all, Moshe told them that they were going to receive the Torah. They didn't receive it until 49 days later. Did they know they were receiving the Torah? Yes. You're frozen. Of counting our, our Omer, the word Sephir to Omer counting of the Omer, right? Okay. You look at the word, oh, what? No, there's no one. Sephirat Omer. Sephirat in Hebrew, Saper means to count. Mm -hmm. Sephira, also Saper, means to shine like a sapphire. We are not just counting the Omer, but we are refining and polishing ourselves. See, when the Jewish people were in the desert nearly 3,400 years ago, they had completely assimilated to the immoral ways of the Egyptians. They were influenced on some level. Obviously, there were certain things that they kept. Right. But the fact that the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt wasn't to credit of their own. They had certain merits, but they were so spiritually sunken at that time that Hashem literally, it was a miracle, literally, that Hashem plucked them out of this sunken impurity. And Kabbalah explains how they were on the, the they were, they were, they were on the lowest level of impurity, this 49 levels of impurity, they were reaching the 49th level. So Hashem plucked them out and it took them 49 days to undergo a radical transformation of refining themselves in order to be worthy of receiving the Torah. So in a sense, the counting of the Omer is not just a counting process. One, two, three, four days are coming. It's a purification process of sort of speak like a self-refinement of the soul. And we pace ourselves. We go day by day. It's not an overnight transformation. Nothing quick, nothing easy comes quick. I'm trying to remind my kids who live in this generation, everything. So, right? I want it now. So, um, 
and, and here's something that Kabbalah teaches that our soul, our neshama, is comprised of two parts. There's the intellect, which is um, what's what's the intellect? Chachma, I'll write it in English. Bina and Da. Chachma, Bina, and Da is wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. Those are my intellectual capacities. Certain things that are wisdom and for those that study Tanya, understand this obviously on a deeper level. Understanding that this is the intellectual element of my soul. There are certain things that I understand on an intellectual level. And in truth, to change someone's intellect is not so hard. If you learn, you study, you have a conversation, you educate yourself, you can change your intellect, right? You could say, oh gosh, how many people come into the class and they say, I, I don't know anything. I'm like, just come. They, they finish one class and all of a sudden they know stuff. It took just 45 minutes, right? You just have to learn. And your wisdom increases, your understanding increases and your knowledge increases. It's that simple in a certain sense. It's easier. It comes to emotions, oh, don't mess, right? We've got traumas of our childhood. We've got preconceived notions. We've got, we've got stuff. We've got emotions. Most people, who don't want to have an intellectual conversation it's because they're emotional the emotions are much of a harder thing to work on and we know that and the 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 the, um, the way um, Kabbalah describes this and this is studied at length in Tanya here is chesed what's chesed? kindness there's givura judgment What's Gavura? Judgment. Discipline or judgment. There's Teferis. What's Teferis? Love. No. Beauty. Passion. Beauty. Beauty. There's Netzach. What's Netzach? Glory. Endurance. Uh, victory. Hode. And love. Is, Humility, uh, Sod, and Malchus. These are the seven emotions, or in Kabbalistic terms, the seven sephirot. Have you ever heard of the seven? Have you heard of the spirit? You've heard of the spirit? You've heard of it? Well, really, there's ten spirit. Each of our soul incorporate these ten sephirot. We've got these three, the Chachma Bin Adas, and we've got, which are the intellectual or the intellectual. And these are the emotions. But the seven, the three intellectual and the seven emotions make up the 10 Sephiro. This is a micro, hello. This is a microcosm for a greater element. Because really, there's 10 sephirot in the world. The world is made up in 10 spheres. God operates in the, hi, Cookie. God operates within the 10 sephirot. Sometimes God operates with chesed, with kindness. Sometimes he operates with gevura, with more of a strictness. Even the names of Hashem are represented in the different elements, right? The name, for example, Elohim, you heard of the word Elohim, is, is an element of gevura. And we're going to discuss this more in depth. I, for some of you, this is new. For some of you, you've heard this. But the idea is that every single one of us are in a constant state of needing to refine these parts of our soul. All that new therapy you hear about anger management, this is what we're talking about. Really, every element, depression, sadness, all that stuff comes from right here. It's targeting a different one of our emotions. This is the psychology of, of, of Torah. It all stems, by the way, from Torah. And for example, like when a child, um, so when we undergo the counting of the Omer, each week we are refining one emotion. Week one, we're refining the emotion of Hesed. Week two, we refine the emotion of Gevura. Week three, we refine the emotion of Teferis. Four, 
49. Every of the seven weeks, we're focusing on one of these emotions. Now, the truth is that each of these emotions are connected to the other seven emotions. In other words, if I, my child touches fire and I smack his hand away because I don't want him to get burnt. Where is that? Is that chesed or gvura? Is that kindness or severity? If I smack them, it's both. So in essence, it's gvura, but it stems from chesed. So there's something called chesed with gvura. There's some, now what if, my kid asked me to do something. I'm just in a bad mood. So I just say, no, you can't do it. And they say, mom, please, no. That's Gvura Sheba Gvura. That's Gvura that's stemming from Gvura. That's not stemming from Chesed. But then there could be Gvura with Teferis. There could be Gvura with Netzach. There could be, you understand? Each of these combinations could be with each of each other. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And if you study it even more in depth, you'll see more of that. But to explain more specifically, the first week that comes after counting the Omer, we work for those seven days of Chesed. How do I divide up that week? Week one is Chesed. Day one, Chesed of Chesed. Day two, Chesed of Gura. Day three, Chesed of Tiferes. D four seven months. Yeah. And then this week two is Gura. Guru Chesed, Guru Tveras. Understand? So every day you target the main emotion, but each of the day, every week, and then each of the days of that week is specific. Get it? And when you really, really do this stuff, you really refine yourself. If you take it seriously. There's this beautiful book that was put up called the 49 steps to personal refinement. And it goes through every day, the sheet of what the day is. So for example, day, you know, you open up the day it, and it gives you like, it tells you the day, it tells you what it is and the exercise of the day. Such a nice book. And I have an extra one. I'm going to wrap Because it's such a nice book. Um, you can buy it in, um, I send you a link, it's $10, but I have an extra one and I'll give it to somebody today to have. It's a beautiful thing because it's, it's, it's a lot of work, but we devote this time. See, when a person's in tune to life, there's so much opportunity. You know, Judaism, we're, we're this is a very precious period. So many people don't even realize. The time period between Pesach and Shavuos is a special, special period of time. We need to tap. We have so much opportunity. There's so much spiritual energy that we're yes. able to access. We just have to know what's going on. We just have to know what's going on. What's what's happening? For example, let's say today is the 30th day of the Omer. Just for fun, right? Day number 30. So we're at week five, day two. Today is Gevura of Hod, which is <laughs> the discipline of humility. <clears throat> Let me just write that in English. So Chesed is kindness, Gevura is discipline. Okay, I'm actually, I'm going to go through it in a second because I'm going to go through each of them. So, for example, because I just want to explain to you what that means. Today is Gevura of Ho, discipline and humility. Humility needs to be disciplined and focused. When should my humility cause me to compromise and when should it not? In the name of humility, do I sometimes remain silent and neutral in the face of wickedness? Another aspect of Gevura of Ho is humility must include respect and awe for the person or the experience before who you, whom you stand humble. If my humility is wanting, is it because I don't respect the other person? 
So the exercise of today is focus on your reluctance to commit in a given area and see if it originates in a healthy, humble place. Deep stuff. All right, so let's take just a minute. What time is it? Oh, wow. Wait, let's take a minute and go through each of the, or, or what it really means, okay? We'll start with chesed, kindness. Kind, uh, or chesed really is, is love. Love is the single and most important component to life. That's why it's the first, right? Because you can give love and you can receive love. So in a sense, love allows us to reach beyond ourselves. Like love to a certain degree is transcendent. Because if you want to really experience another person, they need to be able to experience you. That's what true love is. So in a sense, um, love is in a way the highest experience that one can experience Hashem, can experience God. Because love transcends so many things. And I'm sure in our own life, everybody can think of times that love allowed you to, to transcend. Then there's Givura. So if love or chesed is like the bedrock of human expression, then Givura, in a sense, is the channel to which we express love. Givura is discipline. Discipline is it's like a laser beam focus. Discipline allows us to focus and channel that love. Um, and that's a very good thing sometimes. Sometimes we need to do chesed, sheba chesed. But you know, understand that a person who's chesed, sheba chesed, and by the way, every person can describe themselves in one of the 49 combinations. There are some people you know in your life, they're chesed, sheba chesed. They're kindness, sheba kindness, you know? Like they're, and sometimes what's the negative? Because there's always a negative. They can be a shmata. They can get stepped on, right? Sometimes the chesed needs to have the givura, the discipline. Um, so discipline's a very good thing in life if used properly. Everything, by the way, could be used negative and positive. The parts inside of us that need to be refined is the parts of us that are using it to the negative. Also under givura and discipline comes respect and awe. When you respect someone, that's a sense of givura. It's a, it's a awe, it's a holding back. By the way, you can talk about each of these for an hour. We're just doing the, the easy route. Then there's tiferet. Tiferet, loosely translated, is compassion. Compassion, um, also sometimes known as beauty. Tiferet is the combo. Somebody who's Teferis is the ultimate person because they have a healthy dose of chesed and a healthy dose of gevura. Um, and it's harmony. That's what it is. Um, Teferis also possesses the power to introduce a third dimension, which is truth. See, truth is neither kindness or discipline. But when you have a balance or an imbalance, of love and discipline, then you sometimes have a very limited perspective, right? right? If I have an unhealthy balance of too much love, too much discipline, that's unhealthy. But when we have the balance, there's a certain truth to that. It's healthy, it's real. And you're able to express yourself in a very healthy way. It's, all, it's almost like a painting. When you look at a painting and do just perfect blend of colors perfect blend of colors why is there something so beautiful about that because of the harmony of the colors when you have something that's too much in one direction it, it just sends a different message then there is netzach netzach is endurance endurance or ambition which is basically that you're very driven to make something happen. You're ready to fight for what you believe in. Somebody who has netzach is like a victor, like it's, sometimes it's also described as victory. Um, and there's a certain like commitment 
When a person uses netzach, they're using their, their endurance and their commitment and their ability to fight for something, obviously in a healthy and a productive way. The thing that fuels endurance is hot. What's hot? Humility. Humility is like the silent partner, so to speak, of endurance. That's why the if you saw the way I drew it, Chetzer and Hor work together to Ferris combines them. Netzach and Hod work together, so it combines them. It's, it's, this is like a study of like weeks. I'm actually serious, by the way. The study of the Sphero, this is what Tanya talks about for like four chapters, for those that are interested to study it. Um, but humility is very important because it allows you to yield to another view. But it also should not be confused with weakness or lack of self-esteem. Humility is a certain sense of modesty. It also comes from the word hod, hoda'a, to give thanks, like moda'ani, we thank Hashem. Hod means to think, is that you recognize your qualities and your strengths, but you also recognize that they're not your own. You were given to them by Hashem, and they were given to you for a higher purpose, and not just to satisfy your own needs. So when you recognize how small you are with hod, you're able to recognize how large you can actually become because it's not within your power anyways. Um, so humility is a hard one that we many people strug, struggle with. Um, then there's yisod. Yisod. Yisod, what does yisod mean? Yisod means bonding. Very key element in life to bond. That's the ultimate of the emotional connection, right? So the first five qualities of love, discipline, compassion, endurance, and humility, um, they're interactive, me with you, you with me, right? With two people. But bonding is like a fusion of the two that actually become one. And with when a person doesn't feel bonded, in any relationship, a, a marriage, a husband and a wife, a child, a mother and a you know a child, a father and a child, or a friendship, right? Then you can never really truly be connected because there's a certain token of commitment and devotion that happens when there's a true bond. Um, every person needs bonding in order to flourish and to grow. That's just part of the human, the way Hashem created us. Then there's Malchut. Malchut is uh, sovereignty. Um, sovereignty is the last of these seven attributes, and it's very different than the other six. <laughs> the other six are more of like an action to be kind, to be disciplined. Malchus is a state of being. Um, it's sort of uh, an expression of like a passive expression of human dignity that we each have the ability to be a leader. When I say to be a leader, it's more a sense of a leader in the sense that I belong. That if I belong, see, when a person feels that they belong to whatever it is, if they belong to their parents, they belong to someone in a marriage, they belong. They belong to a community. Sense of belonging is vital. If a person feels that they don't belong anywhere in their life, they're lost. When a person feels that they can belong, that they belong, then they have an ability to be a leader in their own right, whatever that means. It's like when a, for a child, right? When a child feels loved by a mother, 100%, right? They have that sense of security and confidence that they can do anything. Mm -hmm. So that's how powerful that sense of belonging can accomplish. It's like, I have nothing to fear. I'm king of the world. Um, and Malchus, by the way, stems from Melech. Malchus is king, mm -hmm. kingship. So that's a, a five minute description of the seven. And any issue that you have in life, you'll come back to one of these. You're having issues in your marriage, you're having issues in bonding, you're having issues with your kid, you're having issues in this one. You're always going to have all the challenges 
that we have in life stem from one of these seven emotions and, and vice versa. All the blessings that we have in life come from the people that we know that, that have each of these attributes are positive and negative. Like I said, kindness, sometimes you can be too kind. Discipline, you can be too disciplined. Um, endurance, it could be great, but you can knock someone over. Humility could be used in a negative way. Like I'm too humble, so I can't accomplish. Everything could be used positive and negative because we have two souls. We have our neshama, our godly soul, and our animal soul. So if it's used in the animalistic sense, it can be used for the negative. If it's used for the, in our godly sense, it can be used for the positive. Um, so this is what the Sira polishing the Omar. We're not just counting. Now, now you're going to count the days in a very different way. We're not just counting the days. We're counting the days. We're counting each day. What's today? And I'm going to send you a link so you can follow what is the Omer of the day. It's, it's a wonderful self-help exercise that the Torah is just from one verse in the Torah. Um, one last thing I want to, um, I want to mention is that one of the reasons also that we count the Omer is because there's something called the gift of time. And I'm sure that Sphira reminds us of the gift of time that you don't just count these, they make these. And this is why when the Jewish people um, left, do you know the first mitzvah that the Jewish people received? It wasn't circumcision. You would think, what would be the first mitzvah that at, when they became Christian? What would be the first mitzvah that Hashem would command them? The first commandment. You know what it was? What it was um, the blessing of the moon. Very good. The blessing of the moon, the making of the calendar. Because the calendars, they slaves in Egypt, they weren't masters of their own time. They didn't have the freedom to do as they pleased. So now Hashem is giving them the greatest gifts. You're free. You have time. From this point on, on, each and every one of us has control over our time. And um, I read this, this interesting example that imagine there's a bank that credits your account every morning with $86,400. $86, $86,400. Oh, and it, there's no balance. Every single day, it carries over no balance. Whatever you had left from the $86,000, you failed to use it during the day, it's depleted by the next one. What would you do? Every day, you draw out all the $86,400. You're not going to waste it, right? And each of us have a big call time. Every morning, we're credited with 86,400 seconds. Every night, you don't use it, it's lost. Whatever you do to that we fail to invest in a good purpose, there's no balance. It allows no overdraft. So every day it opens a new account for us, right? Each night it burns the remains of the day. If you fail to lose the deposit, it's lost. So we need to live in today's deposit, so to speak. And um, I, I saw this, I'm sure you've heard this, but I'll read it to you. To realize the value here, ask a student who is grade one. To realize the value of one month, ask a mother who gave birth to a premature baby. To realize the value of one week, ask the editor of a weekly newspaper. To realize the value of one hour, ask the friends who are waiting to meet. To realize the value of one minute, ask a person who missed the train. To realize the value of one second, ask a person who just avoided an accident. To realize the value of one millisecond, ask the person who won a silver medal in the Olympics. So we need to treasure every moment that we have. And yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is God's gift. That's why it's called the present. So as we get ourselves the present, as we get ourselves ready for Shavuot, and it's not too late. It's never too late. You can say, oh, I missed it. I, I, we're on day 30. Well, I'm going to count 20 more days. Yeah, count 20 more days. Not a big deal. Still more stuff down here to work on. And by the way, yesterday was the 14th day of ER. The 14th day of ER falls out of the 14th day of Nisan. What happened on the 14th day of Nisan, Jewish month Nisan? 
What happened a month ago? Pesach. On the 14th day of year, a month later, when the Jewish people, for the first time in the desert, they brought the Passover sacrifice. There were a couple of people that came to Moshe. They said, Moses, it's not fair. We were not able to bring this Passover sacrifice. Why? Because we were in contact with the dead body. They were doing a mitzvah. We know that a person that's in contact with a dead body was impure. They were not able to bring the sacrifice. So Moshe came with this complaint to Hashem. And Hashem says, I will give them another chance. And so years later, we celebrate one month after Pesach, which is known as Pesach which means second Pesach. And Pesach Sheni is the ability, like it says in Yiddish, es es karfalen. it's not lost. Hashem always provides a second chance. Never a person should feel like, oh, I missed my chance. I can't do it. There's always a second chance. And it starts today. Hey. So, this is one lesson we learned from the Parsha of Emmer. A lot more to do, but that's going to be our, our end for today. And um, I will see you all next week. You're welcome. And now, now we get lunch. <laughs> yes. I would, I would add to that.